maybe twice the size. Uh, so it will then if we if we make it bigger, then it will have more than 30 hectares. And uh, the new part of the zoo will be for those animals which are uh, which are used to conditions we have in the Czech Republic. The enclosures will be uh, as big as possible to make the conditions for the animals uh, close to the nature conditions as much as possible. And also the expenses for running their enclosures will be lower. So we will not build such big uh, houses and pavilions for uh, which might be temperated and uh, so on. Let's move to, uh, to another slide. It's pretty slow. Yeah. Yeah, I will shut off my camera. Hopefully it will be. Better. Sorry. Good. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Yes, and uh, here is the timeline uh, since the establishment of the zoo in 1904. And there are some uh, years which were quite important for our zoo. Uh, for example, white bears, uh, which we were we, we bred uh, at our zoo. But later there is a picture where you can see the conditions where the polar bears were taken. And you will see how the zoo has evolved also in terms of the welfare and the conditions for the animals. Uh, nowadays, uh, we focus more on animals which are uh, not that, uh, which does, do, don't need so much space uh, or we try to adjust this, uh, adjust it according to the animal's needs. Here are some pictures. From the history, uh, we are we have quite a long history of South American sea lions breeding. We are quite successful in that. We have uh, uh, regularly we have offsprings, and the conditions of uh, having sea lions at our zoo hasn't uh, really changed during the history. Uh, we still do train the sea lions as a form of um, uh, enrichment and it's also and people the visitors quite like the when they can see the process of training with uh, the sea lions uh, it's like the just want to add that the enrichment with the sea lions is uh, really taken 
as a something which is not obligatory for the sea lions, if I can say that. It, it, it uh, solely depends whether the sea lion wants to do that or not, and the, the decision is completely up to each individual. They are not forced to do anything. Uh, and here's the picture. You can see it at uh, the zoo as a place for leisure time. Uh, like this purpose of zoo hasn't really changed during the history, but uh, what has changed is the perception of the uh, reason why we keep the animals there. And we will take it, to, we will go through that uh, later. And here in this picture, you can see an enclosure and here is a white dot and that's the polar bear and this enclosure is such small and you can imagine that there was a polar bear it's incredible and it's not like this enclosure doesn't serve to any species anymore because it's too small and it's not uh, appropriate to anything i would say uh, so this is the example of how the zoo in terms of welfare has changed as well uh, later after the polar bears there were the uh landak uh how to say in english landak landa i forgot uh porcupine yeah it served for porcupines which is much better than polar bears but uh, having polar bears there was incredible and it's we cannot really we are not really able to imagine that that it was uh, real. Uh, yeah. Also, our zoo has changed also in the mm, in terms of how we approach the animals in the history we think that what's the best for uh, for us for people is the best for the animals as well we took them as a pets but actually they are not pets, even though they are in the captivity, they are still wild animals. And we have to, and if we want to uh, keep their, um, their natural behavior, uh, their habits, we should take care of them as naturally as possible. And we shouldn't really intervene their normal uh, development, their normal um, way, how they getting older, getting mature. And we shouldn't really um, make, uh, make from them pets. Uh, but we shouldn't forget about this, that this was happening. And we should uh, also educate people the visitors that these animals are wild and they shouldn't be kept as a pets also uh, because it's not really uncommon these days to have such exotic animals at home uh, for normal people but they don't really know how to treat them professionally so we have to educate and share awareness to people, to visitors through the zoo that these animals should be uh, ideally in their uh, natural environment or if there is no other option at uh, professional organizations like zoos. Yes, and these are pictures, like actual pictures from our zoo. This is the lower part of our zoo. 
uh it's not really big this part and uh, some enclosures like these uh they are not really big but they it serve uh, to its purpose and we are not really able to rebuild it uh, at this moment but we try to make it as much uh, convenient both for animals and visitors for example recently we installed uh barriers so the animals can hide behind the berries uh, if they don't want to be disturbed by the animals and this is uh, inside the uh, pavilion of the tropics where we also have a few species from indonesia uh, for example nicobar pigeon or uh, balimaina and uh, this is an example of how we try to make it as close to the conditions of the of their natural air environment as possible but because we are a pretty old zoo some expositions some pavilions are really really old and they need to be completely reconstructed or uh, we need to build it new ones uh, for example the uh, pavilion of the elephant is very old it doesn't match the standards and uh, it really needs to be done something however uh, we as a zoo where the owner is our uh, city uh, and the city uh, fell into depths uh and so the city doesn't have much funding to make such a huge investments into new facilities at the zoo uh nevertheless at this moment we are changing the owner from the city to the uh, region uh something like a district and hopefully funding for new constructions will be available soon yeah and this is one more picture from the history uh what we don't do anymore uh having jaguar as a pet uh, in this case as a dog is not really the way how we should uh, how we should uh, uh take care of the animals if we want them to reproduce, to breed offsprings, to make exit to programs, and to make to make possibilities for reintroduction or rewilding, we shouldn't really do this anymore. We don't do that, but still, there are some people who think this is normal, and we have to educate, uh, and educate, and educate. And now we moved as a zoo or uh, thanks to all the uh, things we've done before, we are now successful breeders of many species we have. Almost all species we keep, they successfully breed, uh, for example, golden tuckin or the bearded vulture. Later, we will talk about bearded vultures as well, because it's one of our flag species at our zoo, and it's also part of in-situ conservation projects with reintroduction and rewilding in Europe. And uh, now, uh, we have moved uh, from history to uh, nowadays and because uh, czech republic is a post-communist country uh, the borders during the communist era was closed to the west and we were not really able to travel to west europe or to america where the conservation uh, both ex situ and in situ and rate introductions uh, were on a quite high level and we were not really able to learn from uh, anybody. Once the, the communists 
uh, fell and and Czech, and Czech Republic, and we were free to move. Uh, we start to uh, go to conferences, to uh, EASA conferences, to WASA conferences, and we uh, start to see that the the purpose of zoo is not just to having the animals uh, and to let's say entertain or please people but we need to take care of the animals in their in nature as well and um, uh, it took some time when the zoos in the czech republic start to realize that we need to focus more on in-situ conservation as well. And in 2004, our contemporary director, Dr. David Nadel, uh, has become the head of the zoo. And because our director is very open-minded person who really wants to help both humanity and wildlife he started he has started to look for opportunities how to contribute as a zoo to conservation projects primarily on in situ conservation projects so thanks to this man me and adela and other colleagues are at liberate zoo and we can fully focus on in situ conservation projects maybe um, in the future, David will um, be uh, very happy to give you presentation uh, as well. He is a veterinarian, so he might give you more uh, uh, overview about the veterinary work at zoo, both at zoo, but in uh, the field as well. And. Uh, Till now, as a Liberate Zoo, we have around 13 projects we are part of. Uh, it means that we do not, uh, we don't solely contribute financially to these projects, but we also discuss the strategies or we uh, focus on exit to breeding with uh, a purpose for reintroduction or we uh, are part of some platform which focus on the conservation of uh, of the particular species one of the projects uh, we are part of and it's uh, since uh, 90s is the reintroduction of bearded vulture in Europe. Uh, till now, we have, since the 90s, we have successfully bred, I think, more than 25 uh, bearded vultures, from which 14 were released into uh, the nature in Alps or in uh, Spain and uh, those birds are the are those who established a new populations of bearded vultures in europe which were in the past uh, uh, ex exter exterminated by people so at this moment we have bearded vultures uh, in Europe again, thanks to Liberate Zoo. Also, thanks to Liberate Zoo, there are, of course, other institutions which work on this project, like uh, the uh, Gifetus Foundation, which is the, let's say, the leader of this project in Europe. Few more pictures. This is the way how the still juvenile bearded vulture, this is a female, were taken to the mountains where the bird was released. 
and this project is ongoing so i think next year we will we'll have another offsprings and the commission will decide whether this offspring will be part of exit program or whether the offspring will be taken into the will be released into nature another project uh, we are part of and we were one of the establishing party was talarak it was established in 2009 on uh, in philippines on negros island and this project focus on endemics of west visayas uh, among those animals the most important animals uh, are Walden's hornbill, which is this one. Uh, Visayan swarthy pig. There is also Negros bleeding heart doe, uh, Tarictic hornbill, and spotted deer. Uh, we, as a liberate zoo, we also have uh, spotted deer at uh, our enclosure uh, at the liberate zoo. And at this moment, this project. I think of flourish and uh, from let's say few cages. Now there are, I think three facilities which has the ex situ uh, populations. And we have since the beginning of this project, we have already moved together with other institutions and other partners. And of course, with the team on the ground, um, to a step where the hornbills, the tarictic, tarictic hornbills, not this one, but the other one, are released in the uh, Danapa reserve. If I'm not, uh, no, no, Danapa, but ba Bayawan reserve. So uh, from the ex situ conservation, we are moving to in situ conservation and it's uh, connected together. Also part of this project is um, uh, education of people around. Uh, so the animals will be not hunted out again. Also research to uh, learn from our mistakes or successes uh, during the rain, uh, releasing, for example, uh, to make it as uh, successful as possible, and also uh, to share awareness about the highly endangered endemic species of West Visayas. Another project we were uh, as a liberate zoo. Uh, we were part of it from beginning. It's in Indonesia and it's the Kukang Rescue Program, which is uh, based in North Sumatra, uh, in, uh, I think, not really far from Medan. And it, uh, it focuses on conservation of slow lorries. Uh, at this moment, they start to focus on pangolins as well. And one of the main uh, activities they do is uh, uh, education at schools, sharing, uh, spreading awareness, and uh, collaboration with farmers who now protect the wild animals around their fields, around their crops. Uh, so the slower lorries there for example or pangolins are not hunted uh, anymore in that areas uh, but i have to add that this is not just uh, like they do not hunt it because they don't want uh, there is a, there is a uh, the connection between the conservationists and the farmers is that they the farmers produce coffee and the coffee is bought by the conservationist and the conservationist uh, sell it to the consumers in form of uh, coffee 
So there is this uh, symbiosis between farmers, conservationists, with the demand for, uh, for coffee from the customers. And uh, because we were, we started to be active in Indonesia, uh, 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 we uh, came to a point where a liberate zoo, quite small zoo with not very high budget, become uh, the leader and the office of Silent Forest Campaign, which is the European, which is the conservation, the biggest conservation campaign in the world uh, under the uh, European Association of Zoos and Aquarius. It uh, focused, uh, it, uh, the campaign focuses on the Asian songbirds. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure all of you knows that how the Indonesian people like uh, having uh, the birds at, um, at home. Uh, but of course, there are consequences and the birds are disappearing from the, from the forest. Uh, I can show you a video. I'm not really sure whether it will run smoothly. Yes, here is the website of the Silent Forest. The campaign has already ended, but the working group uh, is still active. And there are projects which uh, runs, uh, uh, which still runs. Um, let's show you the video. So that was the video for the Silent Forest campaign. Uh, and here are a few numbers regarding the campaign. There, for the, the purpose of the campaign is to share awareness, but also to collect money for several pre-selected projects, conservation projects in uh, Indonesia. Uh, so you can see that it was quite, there were quite big money which were collected during the campaign. Um, and uh, uh, all the money, all this money were, was uh, 
were going to the projects directly. So nothing, uh, nothing was uh, wasted. Uh, there was also a collection of uh, second-hand uh, binoculars. So we have collected almost uh, 850 binoculars, uh, which were moved to Indonesia and we give uh, the binocular, binoculars to conservation and uh, educational institutions uh, around Indonesia. So might be it, uh, uh, if, it, if you agree, we might offer you few binoculars as well for your university to your, to your uh, research forest. Uh, so uh, Pavelson, maybe later we can, we can talk about it. Uh, and one more thing, uh, recently I have, uh, I was sent a video about uh, birds in Indonesia as well. Uh, it's a really nice video, it's quite long. I'm not gonna play it, but for those who are interested, and I think it's uh, suitable both for adults, but for children as well. Uh, and you, so you can play it. The, there are quite many views already, but if you look for that, sub, sub the alarm, uh, it's also about the birds and the crisis they face uh, because of the poaching. So you can uh, search for that and uh, look, uh, look at it and you might use it later um, during your presentation, for example. Let's move. Yeah, and because we started to be more and more active in Indonesia, uh, we have applied for Vaza Nature Connect grant and we were awarded. And we uh, do a project uh, which was called Many Children, Many Corals. And it was uh, educational projects where we try to enhance the relationship of children to uh, the nature. And we used for that uh, the corals. So we make some kind of uh, like a coral gardens uh, and uh, the children later take care of the corals. And mm, we try uh, to show how the corals, the ecosystem is important for their lives uh, in the area. This project uh, was uh, prolonged once more. And uh, during uh, this, uh, the second part, there was an education campaign on the archipelago or the Pulau Banyak, uh, which was led by Adela. And it was the, the lecturers there were uh, former poachers of uh, sea turtle eggs and the poachers went into jail because they were caught. Uh, and uh, later we offered them to become the lecturers, uh, which they, uh, and they agreed. And we traveled with them uh, all around the archipelago and to other places around the Pulau Banyak uh, to almost 30 schools. And uh, why we were and we are still active uh, in that area is this island, uh, which is uh, Bankaru Island. It's a quite big uh, island. I forgot the area, but it doesn't matter. It's uh, completely covered by primary forest. And this beach is uh, one of the most important nesting sites for green sea turtles. Uh, so we uh, collaborate with the local NGO, Ecosystem Impact on the protection of this island, and we will be more active and still active 
on uh, the protection of Bangaru. And one more thing, this island is also was part of the silent forest campaign as one of the preselected projects because this island holds still holds birds which are protected and endangered. Uh, and because we were quite close to the sea turtles, uh, we uh, were asked to help on Borneo in Berau to help with the tortoise shell trade. So here you can see uh, the products from tortoise shells, the bracelets, the rings, and there are many, many more. Uh, and it's sold on the open market. I think this is the problem, I think, throughout the whole Indonesia. And um, so we connect with local NGOs and also with uh, governmental institutions uh, to deter, to uh, eradicate the tortoise shell from the markets there. Uh, it was successful, the vendors promised us not to sell it anymore, uh, but it wasn't just, uh, it doesn't end just with the promises. Uh, they uh, handed in all their stock of tortoise shell they had at the homes. So later we have calculated that we collected from the vendors, from the owners of the tortoise shell, both raw and already in uh, form of uh, products, we have collected tortoise shell from uh, more than 300 hogs belt turtles. Uh, everything was later uh, demonstratively uh, burned uh, in front of the eyes of the vendors uh, and also uh, with the presence of the vice bupate of the of the uh, region of the district, and later, uh, because the action was successful, we asked our ambassador, uh, His Excellency uh, Ivan Hotek, to award the people who were involved in the successful eradication of tortoise shell in Berau. Here you can see like uh, a tree from glass, uh, which is some kind of uh, offspring of this big tree we have at our zoo. Uh, so it's a part of, a, let's say, a, a story. And this tree represents uh, all the contributors to conservation uh, at our zoo. So you can let uh, contribute to conservation in form of uh, in, in monetary uh, form and you can have your name on the on the leaf. And so people who goes uh, around, uh, this is in the entrance of the zoo. So the visitors can see that you have contributed to the conservation of uh, nature. Yes, and uh, we slowly move forward uh, because we focused on uh, songbirds and thanks to songbirds, we uh, also uh, do a sea turtle conservation and we help with the tortoise shell uh, problem in Berau. We said that we have quite some experience and it would be a pity not to continue with the sea turtle conservation. And uh, we know, we all know that uh, there is a big problem with hogsbill turtles with their tortoise shell. So we start to focus on uh, hogsbill turtles more. And um, with this project, Adela, she's here, took a lead. And now uh, with her leadership, we do uh, other and more activities 
which are focused on the sea turtle conservation, which is awareness, spreading awareness, monitoring, and also research, collecting samples to make the to map the genetic diversity of the both hawksbill turtles and uh, uh, green sea turtles. Yes, and he, we, he, here we are on a Mentaway archipelago with our assistant. Assistants, here's Adela, here's me, and here's other assistants uh, from, from the islands. We as a zoo also focus on the awareness, education, spreading, uh, spreading information. So these are posters uh, which shows the way uh, or the road of the ivory from the elephant, from poacher to those who collect it. And it should serve to people to realize that these, yeah, honestly, for some people, beautiful items, uh, you must kill an elephant. So, and um, we as a Czech Republic in the middle of Europe, some people think that we are not really, uh, we are not really part of that, like because uh, it's in uh, elephants are in Africa or in Asia, and uh, there are not so many people who wants to buy it, the ivory. Uh, but Czech Republic, uh, sadly, is uh, considered as a one of the transition countries uh, which uh, the traffickers take when they want to uh, move ivory from one country to another. So yes, we are also part of this problem and we have to deal with that. There is another education or awareness campaign uh, which try to show, which try to, which tries to show uh, the threats the wildlife faces uh, because of our activities, our habits. Uh, if you want to later look uh, at all the posters regarding this uh, campaign, which is called Stolen Wildlife, you can uh, look at it at uh, our website. Uh, for example, this is uh, this poster shows uh, the problem with uh, carbofuran or other other chemicals or or drugs which are used to poison the vultures. Yes, and another a poster from the campaign which uh, shows or try to ask people whether it, they really believe that some of the products will help them to both cure or improve their physical conditions which uh, usually, thanks to the research, uh, the information are not really true. It's not really correct. Yeah, and where we are now uh, at uh, Liberet Zoo and Conservation today, here is the link. I will sh later show you our, our website, who wants to know more about uh, our, our zoo. Um, a few years ago, as I have already said, uh, we didn't really have somebody who was uh, focused only on in situ projects, even though it's everything is interconnected. But now we have our own, own department and we uh, try to do as much as possible as a small zoo in the small country to do conservation and research. 
Uh, thanks to our effort, and I hope uh, and I can say that uh, even with small funding, we can do uh, little big, big little things uh, towards biodiversity conservation. And we are supported, for uh, example, uh, by uh, Liberates region. And thanks to them, we can afford to have our own department for biodiversity conservation. So uh, yeah, here are the logos of our partners, collaborators. There are quite a lot. I am afraid that there are few which are missing as well. And I really hope that uh, in the near future, uh, Andalas University can be another partner of us and we can do projects uh, which will be which will help to our beautiful biodiversity in the world uh, to flourish yeah and the uh, website for you to know where to search for more information So uh, here is the list of, it's a little bit slow. Yeah, it's slow. Doesn't matter. I will send you the link to to the conversation. Ah, it's already there. Thanks, Adela. Yeah. Oh, no. And, uh, that's um, pretty much all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I look forward for uh, questions. And if anyone of you are more interested in anything I have mentioned in that presentation, please, uh, you can reach me out at this email address. Or uh, Pavelson can share you, share with you my WhatsApp number as well. So once again, thank you, uh, and uh, have a nice day. Okay, thank you, thank you a lot, Pavel, for your presentation. I hope that you all enjoyed it. Uh, so it was like brief overview of our zoos and also several examples how uh, zoos in in Europe uh, works now, how they are moving from the animal breeding also to conservation. Uh, maybe I will just add a quick update regarding uh, our sea turtle research because we have been doing also several activities uh, regarding sea turtle trace, trade already in, in Padang. And one of the UNAN students, Lucy, uh, was helping us with, uh, with community service. And she will be now, uh, uh, she has as her uh, bachelor thesis topic that is connected with sea turtle trade in, in West Sumatra. Mm, so I'm really happy for, for Lucy and about her uh, engagement uh, in our in our activities. Uh, I think we have still a couple of minutes. So if you have some questions, be free to ask. You can ask directly or or in chat. Uh, maybe if you are 
a little bit afraid uh, afraid of English, you you are free to ask also in in Indonesian, and we will we will try to uh, answer with our uh, with our Indonesian, <laughs> which is not always good, but uh, we are able to to communicate. <laughs> So be free to ask or or write uh, in a chat. We will give just some small time uh, in case you you are thinking about your questions or I also hope that the uh, that everything uh, regarding the presentation was fine that uh, you could hear us and uh, see the presentation well and uh, I have also sent you a couple of links in, in the chat. So you can see there uh, some videos on that are available on YouTube and also the website of Liberate Zoo if uh, you are interested uh, to read more about the projects that, uh, that our zoo has. So maybe if anyone, if there is no one who has some questions and if Pavel doesn't have anything that he would like uh, to add, I think that we can just finish. <laughs> As I already said, you can reach me out on my email or you can ask Pavelson to share with you my number. So you can later, when you think about it or if something came up uh, into your mind, uh, you can write me uh, later. Uh, I will be more than happy to answer the questions you have. Uh, so uh, once again, thank you everybody for your attention. Thank you, Adela, for, for uh, your leadership and uh, hope to see you soon with at least some of you in the near future. Yeah, there, uh, is there, is, uh, there is Budevi asking. So. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure there is just like hand raised. <laughs> I'm not sure if she's talking or not because uh, she's muted. Oh, yeah, now it looks. I'm uh, very sorry. It's raining heavily in Padang. So our network is not good. Um, I just want to say that the presentation and information were very interesting for us because we also have a zoo in West Matra. Not far from Padang, it's about uh, 100 kilometers. We really hope we can also do the small thing to the existing, to the zoo on, the way, on uh, Bukit Tinggi, the name of the town. So your present present is very, very uh, interesting. And make a, we, uh, we have uh, many plans to our Zoom. Thank you.
for your presentation. Thank you, Adela. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to Bu Devi. Thank you, Ibu Devi. You're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, we both hope with, with Pavel that we will have more opportunities in, in the future to, to see you and meet with you uh, more often. <laughs> so, yes, uh, yes, we do hope. So I'm sure this is not uh, the last time. <laughs> <laughs> we do hope, yes. <laughs> Uh, there is question in in chat from Lintang Yodi. Um, the question is: Is there any challenge when doing uh, all of these conservation projects, especially projects that collaborate with local communities? What are the challenges? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, conservation itself is a challenge generally. <laughs> And uh, uh, if you do a conservation project, you always work with local communities. You are not really able to come somewhere and start the conservation projects without having discussions or uh, uh, collaborate with local communities. So it's an essential part of every conservation projects and of course it really depends on many factors uh, on the previous situation uh, whether there was uh, a conservation project uh, before and uh, they have a bad experience or whether there are more interests uh, in the area for example there is a um, plan for development but also there is a rich biodiversity so there is a like a there is a fight between conservationists and developers and the com communities of course some of the people think that the development is uh, more important than the conservation uh, so it depends on the way how you approach the people how you approach the developers as well, because you know uh, you cannot really say, "Oh, this area is conserved; you we will protect it, and nobody can do anything there." It's about uh, to it's about to find a solution, uh, ideally a win-win solution for all the sides. Of course, it's not really possible, uh, uh, or in most cases, it's not really possible. And uh, some of the um, stakeholders uh, or parties need to do some, uh, uh, let's say, changes in their plans. But always it's good and it's necessary to communicate. Without communication, uh, uh, the project uh, is uh, about to end. So this is how I see it. Uh, I hope uh, it's uh, my answer is sufficient for you. Yeah, thank you, Pavel. It's, it's always also a lot of work with people and a lot of communication in in conservation so even though if uh, we call us like zoologist or biologist or conservationists we still have to work a lot with with the people <laughs> uh, thank you a lot for for the question uh, there is also uh, the attendance list so if you did not fill it yet uh, I think you should <laughs> you should fill it <laughs> does anyone have have uh, some other questions for for Pavel or for yeah for us <laughs>
So if, if not, I think that uh, this is all from us for today. Thank you again for your uh, participation and also uh, we would like to thank a lot to, to Pat Wilson and others from the Department of, of Biology for the invitation and for the opportunity to participate uh, at this lecture. So um, have, a, have a nice uh, afternoon and uh, hopefully see you uh, see you in the in the future. Thank you everyone. Have a Thank great you, day. Have Thank a great you, afternoon. Adela. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.